But before we go into our study, I would like us to be able to bow our heads as we seek the Lord in prayer. Our dear Lord, as we come to you, we pray that you will speak through me, anoint my lips with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you can open our ears that we might hear, that we can take these words that will be impressed upon our minds, our hearts, so we're not just people which come to church on Sabbath, but we're people which are true Christians, true Seventh Adventists throughout every day of the week. This is my prayer. My prayer also for the prayer requests we've had. Those people needing help, those people which are suffering. We pray also for those people doing outreach work. We pray for the outreach work next Sabbath. And we thank you for all which you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I was asked to preach this sermon a year ago. And I thought and thought. And then someone asked me, said, you asked me, I asked you to preach a sermon a year ago and you haven't. So today I'm preaching today, but I need your help, okay? Because it's not going to be me preaching this sermon solely. There's questions where I need you to shout out a short answer for this sermon. But the scripture reading is from Ephesians. So when you turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5 verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. And this was the sermon that someone specifically asked, I preach a sermon on this specific text. But the sermon title is Christ, the Church, the Husband, the Wife. But let's read this one text. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice there, and this is something where we need to make sure of the English language here. Love your wives. Does that mean we should have multiple wives? No. Why? Exactly. I'm glad you know your English well. Husbands. Husbands and wives are linked together. This is why the English language and the choice of words we use in our communication is extremely important. But now is it possible to preach a sermon solely and exclusively on one text? Or do we need to look at the sermon, the, the title of that text or the entire of that text before and after and other parts in the Bible? Because the way we understand and learn the Bible is the Bible should translate the Bible. My word's irrelevant. So what I want you to take away from this today is the Bible text, the Bible scripture and the spirit of prophecy. If I say words in between, forget about those words. Look at the Bible and the spirit of prophecy because they are inspired. But I want us to be able to look at Ephesians 5 verse 20 all the way down to verse 33 it starts giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God wives submit yourselves unto your own Husbands, as unto the Lord. Let me just pause for a moment. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. Does that say, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, providing your husband is X, Y, and Z? Is there a condition? Does it say, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, providing your husband is rich, providing your husband is godly, providing your husband is whatever the list might be, it does not say that, 
But in the context of other areas of the Bible, we need to seek God first and put God first. So if your husband or your wife is expecting something which is not godly, God comes first. And then your husband, of course, or your wife. But I want to read on. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now the, the scripture reading, which was, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now does that say, Husbands, only love your wives if your wife is doing this, or your wife is doing something else, or your wife is doing whatever. There is no condition to it. It is husbands love your wives. As simple as that. So if you've taken the commitment to get married to your wife, no matter what she does, or again, of course, the other way around as well, you need to love your wife no matter what. This is not saying for you to put your wife above Christ and God. No, because that would be wrong. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. But let's read on. So 25, we'll read that once more. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. This is the great mystery by speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see see that she reverence her husband. There is no conditions in there. Okay? And I say that because sometimes we go through life and we say, well, my wife did this. So maybe that text no longer applies. Or my husband did that. So I should not reverence him. I don't see any conditions in those texts, do you? No. So despite what your husband, despite what your wife does, obviously there are exceptions, but despite what may happen, we still have our duty and we still have what is required of ourselves. And I say this, sometimes I say, well, often this is the case. It's easy to say the words, but it's hard to live the words. And I'm not preaching this sermon to say, look at me, the perfect husband. Because by all means, I'm not. By all means, I have a lot to learn. But I was asked to preach this sermon, so I'm preaching this sermon. But I would like to turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 20 to 24. So I ask this question. Well, I'm going to, let's read it, then I'm going to ask you the question. This is where I need your help. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 20 to verse 24. And this is how God's original plan. But I want to read this. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found on and hit found and help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord gave, which sorry, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Didn't we just read that same scripture, but later on in the Bible? So I have a question for you. Why was, Ad, why was Eve created from a rib from Adam? Why not from parts of the skull? Why not part from maybe the toe? Why? To be... To be equal, that's one, what um, one person is saying. Anything else? Come on, help me. You, you think you've got to talk in Sabbath school. You've always got to speak in the sermon as well. So you can be the ultimate help, support. What else? Well, you're a one-star student so far, but what else from other people? To stand by Adam's side. There's also something else which I thought about here. And maybe this is just my own words. But the rib is close to the heart. And the heart is used as a, a symbol of love and to cherish. So this was God's original plan. To stand by Adam's side. To be equal with Adam. I'm just repeating some of the words that you're saying here. But now, God created this world, as we know, as in Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And that, when everything which God created was perfect. And then what came along? Sin. We all know, so true and so sad, the story of sin. But this time, when you should stay in Genesis, why don't you go to Genesis 3, verse 14 to verse 19. So we have God's original plan. Mankind sinned. And now we have a new revelation, a new instruction for, in this case, it was Adam and Eve, but Adam and Eve is figurative of the human race today. So Genesis 3 verse 14, starting there, 2 verse 19. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed, and above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So first thing here, because of sin, we see that the serpent is now cast to only slithering on his belly. Verse 15. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Enmity between mankind and the church. Sorry, mankind and the church on one side, and the devil symbolized by the serpent on the other. So that's something else which was influenced by the sin in the Garden of Eden. Now in verse 16. Unto the woman he said, 
I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, I've never had children, as hopefully you could figure that out. But there's some mothers in the audience here. Was, would you say, if you had a bit of a spare time, you'd give childbirth as a hobby, as a fun thing to do? Or is it painful? Painful? I think you are. Other mothers? Is it painful or is it a delight? I, from speaking to most women, it's painful, it's sorrow. That's why they call it labor. It's laborous. And then the second part of this text here is, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So this is a result of sin. This is directly a consequence of Adam and Eve sinning in the garden of Eden. And verse 17, this is the instruction to Adam. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commended thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of any of it, cursed in the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now I appreciate in this modern day, it's not just the guys which go out to work. It's also many females, especially if there's no children. But, let me ask you a question. Those which are doing gardening, is it fun to go out gardening in the heat of the day and be dealing with thistles and nettles and the consequence of sin? Is it fun to grab something and you get stung? To grab something and you get thorns in your hands? No. It's not fun at all. But this is a consequence of sin. So this sermon was titled... Christ, the church, the husband, the wife. To understand this subject and to understand what we read in Ephesians, we need to understand the character and nature of how God originally set things up in the Garden of Eden to the consequence of sin afterwards and also to look at the responsibility of Christ and the church. Once we put all of those things together, then we can have a greater understanding of this particular text. But the devil always wants to change God's plan. We see that today. Let's look at Genesis 1 verse 27. Genesis 1 verse 27 reads, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Today you see a movement in this world to talk about there are many different genders. From my Bible I understand there is only two genders. Also, when Adam created, he created Adam, a male, and created Eve, a female. It wasn't Adam, and as some people say, Adam and Steve. It was Adam and Eve. But what is trying to be done today is trying to destroy that relationship which Christ made back then in the Garden of Eden. Hopefully you see that. But also now in Genesis 2 verse 2. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2, we see something else which was set up in the Garden of Eden, which is also being destroyed. Genesis 2 verse 2 reads, And on the seventh day 
God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So that's another institution which was made in the Garden of Eden. First, you had man and woman being married. Second, you had the Sabbath day. And what do we see happening now with the actual Sabbath day? People want to meet God maybe on a Friday, maybe on a Sunday. And as we look at our Sabbath school, Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, Saturday, was set aside specifically for mankind. But the devil is trying to destroy what God set up, especially. So the plan was for husband and wife to stand by but stand side by side. Then sin came along and we see a resetting or a new relationship set up as instruction for God. Husband to rule over the wife. That's not my words, that's what the Bible says. I'm just paraphrasing it. But a true husband will do this in love. But, my brothers and sisters, like many things, the devil is trying to destroy what God has set up. How many times do you hear of a dictatorial husband? How many times do you see in other types of communities or other backgrounds, you see the extreme taken? The wife should walk two or three paces behind. That is abusing what God has said in the Bible. Many different things have been abused both ways around on each side of a specific relationship. The devil always wants to change God's way. God set out an original plan. Because man, man sinned, God changed things for the benefit of mankind. Let us imagine if the human race did not have to work harder. They would have more time to experiment in sin. That was a blessing from God that the work of what was assigned to Adam was made harder through the consequence of sin. So let me ask you another question. When you look at the so-called woman's lib movement, and be careful with this one, because many people have abused this situation, but when you look at the so-called woman's lib movement, why is it always, there's different reasons behind this, but why is it always that, that they want to make sure that there's enough females in the boardroom? Why won't they make sure there's enough females in parliament? Why? And I want to set that aside. I want to tell you a little story. When I was in Zambia, I was, remember watching TV and I found it really quite amusing. Because Zambia, in social change of the communities, is probably about, when I was there, probably about 40 or 50 years behind the Western world. But I remember being on the, on the news that the women wanted the right to go out to work to make desks. They want that right to go out to work. Which I find is quite interesting because if I then travel back to the United Kingdom, and I asked maybe mon many of the modern women in the workplace, if you had enough money to not need to come to work, would you prefer to stay at home? Yeah. And a lot of them, as we just shout out here, say yes. So be careful for what you wish for. But let me ask that question. Because of sin, as we learned in Genesis, it was that the male was to rule over the female in the husband and wife relationship. But why is there a determined effort to make sure there is enough representation of females in the workplace? A female in, in sorry, in the um, boardroom. The boardroom controls the workforce. Why? Why is it only in that aspect and it's not in the aspect of making sure we've got enough females out there sweeping the streets? I ask the question, why is it in a position of control 
that there's this movement to make sure we've got enough women in the boardroom. Yes, shout out the answer in a short sentence. Okay, so to be a counterfeit leader. But if you notice what happened in Genesis, because of sin, the relationship changed. You can put your hand up. No, you're just moving your hand maybe. Okay. But this is interesting because a family, or a husband and wife, or a relationship, should be a microcosm of society. What happens at home should, will, will naturally be mirrored in the wider sphere in the wider world. But the devil always has a counter attack to implement something which is different than God's original plan or God's plan I should say. We see that Sunday and the Sabbath we see that male and female with marriage. See the homosexual movement. But I want to move on. In Ephesians 5, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. But make sure God is first. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now let me ask you a question here. What was the original plan for Adam? Adam was supposed to be the leader of... You should know this. You're shouting out. You're saying something. Speak up. The whole dominion of the whole world. If it wasn't for Adam's sin, the world would not have fallen into the state it is today. God's plan for the husband and the wife is for the husband to take the responsibility and to lead forward. It is the husband's duty to love the wife and cherish the wife and protect the wife. If your relationship is falling apart, husbands first look at yourselves. As your duty to be a perfect husband, yes, you will make mistakes, yes, you will do things which are wrong, but that's why we have grace, isn't it? But no matter what happens in your relationship, husbands, be that priest of the home. Lead by example. Not with an iron rod or an iron fist, but with something so much more powerful, with love. Even if your wife is the worst wife in the world, that's irrelevant. What is relevant is what you do in the relationship. And also wives. This may be harder because your husband may have let you down, or he may be letting you down. But wives, no matter how your husband treats you, yes, it's easy to say the words theoretically, but it's harder to implement the words. No matter how your husband treats you, you're still a child of God, and you still have a duty to love, cherish, and also to show respect, which is hard. I'm not saying any of this is easy, I've made enough of my own mistakes. But we also now need to look at Christ's relationship with the church. 
So if Ephesians 5, 23 to 25, I know we keep reading these texts, but it's important and relevant. Ephesians 5, 23 to 25, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. But to, do, to understand this, we need to explore what relationship did Christ have with the church. Because this text does not mean that whatever your wife says, do it, does it? If it did mean that, then Adam eating the fruit would have been fine. Because Eve said, here's the fruit, take it. And the Bible also says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We know that Christ died for the church and his followers. He had such a deep love for the church, he died for the church. He loved the church so much, he would do anything for the church. But we need to remember that his calling was first to his God, our God, the God of heaven. In John 9 verse 4, it reads, I must work the works of him that sent me, while as day the night cometh when no man can work. And this is the thing, my brothers and sisters, and often the devil uses your husband or your wife. In this case, we looked at Eve in the Garden of Eden, but we see many examples around us how we're still tested and tried and tempted by the one we love dearly. On John 5, verse 17, John chapter 5, verse 17. This is looking at Christ's relationship with his Father, our Father. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. And obviously in John 10, verse 30, a few pages over, I and my Father are one. I can tell you one thing you know, my brothers and sisters. I would be such a better husband if my relationship with my Savior was stronger. If I was at one with my Father in heaven on all aspects of my life, how much better husband I would be. Maybe you can ask the same thing there, if maybe you're a female. You can say if your relationship was better with Christ, how much better your relationship would be with your husband. But we need to remember something also. That despite how your partner is, your first duty is to God. And there's no excuse. It doesn't say husband loves your wife providing she's making good food. Providing she's doing this, providing she's doing something else. Doesn't say it, does it? You made the decision to be with your husband or your wife, you be the perfect husband or wife. Christ's calling was to his father, and his mission, and his mission was to die for the church. Our mission is to our wife. Our mission is to take the message to the world. If we have children, our mission is to the ch children also. But how sad it would be. Listen to this. How sad would it be if your wife or your husband isn't in the kingdom of heaven because of you? And what I mean by that is, I'll use myself as an example. I've got a lot of learning to do. I've got a lot of character refinement to do. I need your prayers for that. But how sad it would be if my wife Michelle was not in the kingdom of heaven because I was a bad example 
I didn't lead her to Christ. How sad that is. And you can put yourselves in those positions and ask the questions yourselves. But let me ask you a question now. Did Christ do everything which the church wanted him to do? No. Because seek ye first the kingdom of God. Remember the church in John 19 verse 15. John chapter 19 verse 15. We have two, exa two examples here. So this is what part of the church wanted in John 9 verse 15. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. So that's part of what the church wanted to destroy their saviour. But the saviour loved the church so much and loved you and I so much that he was willing to suffer the death of the cross. But there was another element of the church. They wanted something totally different. They wanted Christ to reign as the new king of the earthly kingdom of Jerusalem. Do you remember that? Did Christ listen to what that part of the church wanted? No. Because Christ's mission from God was there. And Christ needed to follow his mission. So it's getting the balance. It's linking these things together. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But also, as we're going to read in a few moments, the importance of our husband or our wife. I would like to read from the pen of inspiration. First of all, from 7 Testimonies, page 46. You now have duties to perform that before your marriage you did not have. Put on therefore kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Give careful study to the following instruction. The text again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. In everything, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Marriage is a union for life is a symbol of the union between Christ and his church. The spirit that Christ manifests toward the church is the spirit that husband and wife are to manifest toward each other. Neither husband nor wife is to make a plea for rulership. The Lord has laid down the principle that is to guide in this matter. The husband is to cherish his wife as Christ cherishes the church and the wife is to respect and love her, her husband both are to cultivate the spirit of kindness being determined never to grieve or injure the other my brother and sister both of you have strong willpower you may make the power a great blessing or a great curse to yourselves and to those with whom you come in contact. Do not try to compel each other to do as you wish. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Manifestations of self will destroy the peace and happiness of the home. Let not your married life be one of contention. If you do, you will both be unhappy. Be kind in speech and gentle in action giving your own wishes. Watch well your words, for they have a powerful influence for good or for ill. Allow no sharpness to come into your voices. Bring unto your united life the fragrance of Christ-likeness. 
These are powerful texts. That was from 7 Testimonies, page 46. The husband and wife are to complement each other. Sometimes I will ask my wife for her opinion. Sometimes she'll ask me for my opinion. But why? There is that book out there which talks about men are from Mars and women are from Venus. As we've been created very differently. But as a husband and wife, we can complement each other. From 2 Testimonies, page 85. You are not just in your family. You have a work to do there. Make your wife comfortable and happy first, then consider the condition of your children. Provide them with comfortable food and clothing. Then, if you can, without limiting your wife and children, help those who most need help and bestow your favors where they will be appreciated. It will be praiseworthy for you to be liberal, but your first and most sacred duty to your family. They should not be robbed for others to be favored. Let your benevolence, your liberality be seen in your own family. Give them tangible proofs of your affection, interest, care, and love. This has much to do with your happiness. Cease finding fault and scolding your wife, for this only makes it much harder for you and makes a hell for her. Look at that. Guys, that's quite a rebuke, isn't it? You know, if you look at your wife, you can probably, as an example, find a hundred good things about her and maybe five not so good things. And what do we focus in on as humans? The bad and not the good. But the same does also applies to the wife. When you look at your husband, if you're honest, you can probably see many good things about your husband and a few bad. Let's try and work on the positive and try and encourage. And as we encourage, then the person can work on their own accord on those other things. If you've had children, if you know with children, if you're constantly saying you're doing this bad, that bad, that bad, and something else, they'll get discouraged. Same as if you have staff which work for you in a company. If you're constantly picking on what they're doing bad and not encourage them and working with them, they'll get discouraged. So let's look at the positive. Let's encourage and let God work through the Holy Spirit so that our partner can be empowered but can perfect their character and their duty as husband or wife. From thoughts to the amount of blessings, now, as in Christ's day, the condition of society presents a sad comment upon heaven's ideal of this sacred relation. Yet even for those who have found bitterness and disappointment where they had hoped for companionship and joy, the gospel of Christ offers a solace. The patience and gentleness which his spirit can impart will sweeten the bitter lot. The heart in which Christ dwells will be so filled so satisfied with this love that it will not be consumed with longing to attract sympathy and attention to itself. And through the surrender of the soul to God, his wisdom can accomplish what human wisdom fails to do. Through the revelation of his grace, hearts that were once indifferent or estranged may be united in bonds that are firmer and more enduring than those of earth the golden bonds of a love that will bear the test of trial. Now, if you're in a relationship where your relationship is perfect, no arguments, no problems, everything is perfect, then you have a duty to help others and encourage other people. If you're in a relationship where maybe you have some trials, some struggles, maybe some arguments, then you have a duty as husband and wife, led by the head of the family, the husband, the priest of the husband, the priest of the home, to try to improve by first working on yourself and trying to lead in love. I'll tell you, from my experience, it's not easy. Maybe your experience is easier. 
I don't know. But if you're in a relationship where you're doing genuinely everything you can and still the devil has got hold of your partner and whatever you do it will not work, there's still hope. Because God can still work miracles. God can still send the Holy Spirit. But no matter what happens, we are only responsible for our own actions. If our husband or our wife is doing something wrong, we can try and pray for them, encourage them, help them, but we are responsible for our own actions. And my brothers and sisters, we need to remain faithful. Faithful no matter what. Because this world is just a blink in eternity. This world is just passing through. We have a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. In a few moments, our Savior will become in the clouds of glory. So let's try to make our homes heaven on earth. But we have the blessed hope of heaven and eternity to look forwards. Don't let anything take that from you. Whether it's your job, your work, your family. Nothing is more important than seeing my Savior come in the clouds of glory. As we've been looking at the family, as we've been looking at the husband, the wife, the church, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, let's pray for one another and help one another. Let's pray for me. I need your prayers. By, for, by all means, I'm not a perfect husband. I've got a long way to go. But I need your prayers that I can be a perfect husband to my wife, Michelle. Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. This walk is not an easy walk. Life can be hard. But with God in our families, in our homes, it can be such a sweet blessing. May God richly bless each one of you today.